All right, so to continue where I was, um, what I did was to identify my trend line. This is just for my trend lines. Um, I've already I'm already done with the major, the quarter, and the minor key levels. If you guys need the numbers, I've referred to it in the chat box. Um, but yeah, so in order to draw trend lines or identify the trend of the market that you're currently in, you identify the the highest high and the next and the next highest high. So I wouldn't draw a trend line here because then that would show the line. Let's say, let me move my trend line so you guys can see what I'm talking about. I would move it here to go with this, and there you go. That means I broke my trend. So that would make you take a trade that would probably be not not a solid trade anyway, just for the simple fact that. Um, it completely didn't respect the technicals. But as of right now, you can see with my current trend lines, you can see that um, the charts are respecting my technicals. Um, so the way that I did it here is that you usually you don't need two trend lines. And once you got one, you could generally identify what type of market that you're in. So in terms of a longer time frame, because remember this is on the daily, I would say that USD JPY is currently um, bearish, which means it's downtrending right now. And the way that I did that was from my trend lines. As you can see, I identified it from the lowest point. Also, you got from like the highest low to the lowest low. I also have a trend line. So that further validates the fact that I think I'm in a down in a downtrend market. Um, so I definitely recommend ident um, doing the trend lines on the daily time frame, the four hour time frame, and the one hour time frame. Because trend lines on a, on a bigger time frame than a day uh, usually are like too vague in order for you to get a good ideal point of entry or a good idea for a trade. However, um, time frames below an hour are a little bit too volatile or move a little bit crazier in order to identify the overall trend of the market. So you can catch where optimal uh, trade entry points are. And the way that I trade in order to identify what I think of what an optimal trade is, is that I'm an intraday trader and a swing trader. So generally uh, my trades, I usually uh, execute within a couple of hours in order for me to get a fully result or maybe a few days to a few weeks in order to fully get a result that I would wish for. So that's the way that I trade generally as of right now. Um, and that's why I go from the higher time frames. So like I said, I go on the daily. Uh, this is my, these, these white lines here are my trend lines for the daily. And then I'm gonna zoom in now on the four hourly. And you're going to notice here, I have another line here, this purple one. Um, I'll probably make it a little bit brighter so you guys can see it. That's probably a little bit worse, actually. Is that better? Oh, it's too bright. All right, I'm going back to my original color, guys. I'm sorry if you guys can't see it. I'll zoom in on it. So this purple line here above my, my other purple line, I've got two purple lines. All right, my color coding needs a little bit of work. I apologize if this is a little visually confusing. Um, but... What I did was I identified the four hour trend from this extreme high because like I said, when you're going in onto smaller time frames, folks, you guys want to zoom in physically on your charts. You don't need to see what was going on in the beginning of 2017 in order to identify uh, what's happening on four hour charts in March of 2018. So as you can see, my trend started here about the beginning of February and I've been noting the, the downtrend on the four hourly from the beginning of February and the last point that I had it touch was here on the 27th of February. And when the week, when the weekend closes, depending on how these play out here, I'll extend my trend lines. Uh, another thing I recommend too, I uh, recommend uh, marking your charts on the weekends when the, when the markets are not moving, because then you'll be able to get a bigger, a better picture of what it is that you're trying to accomplish in there. Um, so that's it for trend lines daily, four hour and one hour. Okay. Now I'm going to go a little bit more into, uh, what Robert was saying about the, uh, wait, I'm sorry. Can you guys see, move this window away from the shared application? Can you guys see my, uh, USDJPY screen or type, type a number in there, any number in the chat, if you guys can see it. Yes. Okay, cool. Sorry about that. All right. Um, so identify the trend on the four hourly. I have mine being purple and then go into the one hourly if you wish and get a, even a smaller time frame picture. So I could theoretically here draw another trend line for the one hour. And I would start here. Or actually I could start here. Um, now for the sake of, for the sake of getting a smaller time frame uh, trade, I'm going to start here at the trend line, but also at the lowest point, now I'm going to extend it out this way. So 
that trend is still like um, currently forming, so I wouldn't even necessarily do this like this. As you can see, this is the, I'm showing you a, a wrong way in order to draw a trend line, guys. I apologize if I was uh, I wasn't being specific about what I was doing here. I'm, this is the wrong way to draw a trend line. So this is because of a downtrending market. You would not necessarily want to have this as your trend line. Um, this little red line I have going on over here. So um, in terms of having a one hour trend line, the only thing I really need to do is probably extend this four hour to be a little bit more precise because just drawing extra trend lines would just be that extra. So you don't have to worry about being too extra guys. You don't want your charts to look too crazy. I know mine's already look crazy as is, but you know, don't, don't add to that, you know? Um, but another thing that I definitely want to put into the thing, because this is my, this is my checklist, if you will. The first thing on my checklist is identify the major quarter and minor key levels. First thing on my checklist. Second thing on my checklist, check the trend line on the daily, the four hour and the one hour. Okay. My third, my third, uh, Thing on the list is moving averages okay now this is a little bit different than a straight up technical and the reason why is because these are known as indicators this is something that your chart naturally does if you choose to let it do it's nothing you have to implement or learn how to read necessarily but so what you're going to do is here you're going to go to the here on the indicators tab of your trading view and you could search for it put moving average there's going to be a couple that pop up but the main one you want to focus on is the regular moving average um, as you can see right now, I have three currently open. They pop up here on the top left underneath the pair that you're currently looking at. Okay, I have three currently open, but um, for beginners, I would definitely just recommend keeping to two. So I'm going to turn this off just to show you guys what I'm talking about. Um, and the first moving average, which you want to do, or whether you guys want to use my colors or not, is I like red. And um, I put the input here for the length of seven, which signifies seven days. And then you're going to do the second moving average identified as the 21 days. So you put one is the seven of the length, which is my red one and 21 days is the blue one. Okay. And the reason why these moving averages are cool to me is because I don't know if you guys can see, uh, whenever the, the red and the blue lines cross each other, the markets tend to go the opposite direction that it was originally going. And the way that I can show you guys here is that, look, I'll show you, this one right here, you guys can see that the red and the blue crossed over here. And it was like, before doing that, the market was trying to be uptrending, but then it did cross over and then completely sank. Okay, that's just one, one way I can see it. You know what I'm saying? There's another one literally right next to it. This one right here. This one is the one that's showing that it was trying to do the uptrending thing. And the reason why I identified that is because, look, it crossed over. Let me even zoom in on it. It crossed over there and it tried to uptrend. And the main reason why, and the main reason why I was not able to, to complete the uptrend was because another way that these moving averages work besides just looking at whenever they cross over guys, is that um, if the candles, uh, you guys know what open and closing is, I assume so, uh, this, is, this is intermediate, you guys should know what an opening and closing of a candle is. So what you guys want is the closing of the candles to either be above or below both of those lines. And the reason why is because these lines, similar to Robert's horizontal lines and my key levels, also act as support and resistance. And what I mean by that is, you see how after it crossed over, the candles begin to close above the two lines and tried to go into uptrending market. But the reason why you knew that it didn't remain in the uptrend was because of thanks to stuff like Ash was teaching us, the candlesticks show us that it tried to go uptrending with this wick, but ultimately failed to do so with these, in, with these uh, engulfing candles. He doesn't recommend you take trades on engulfing candles, but I actually have one ideal setup that has a, an engulfing candle within it, which is, which is pretty, which worked out pretty well for me. I'll get more into that when I get into the candlestick check, checklist point, but this is to, still to move on the moving averages part. Um, but the candlesticks are breaking above the, the, the stick. I mean, the, the lines of the moving averages, which implies that the markets wanted to go the opposite direction. But once you, so for example, if you saw that happening, a lot of people would have probably gotten in on a buy and realistically you probably would have had a, a take profit generally around where your trend line was. Um, because stuff usually has to respect the trend. You trade with the trend because the trend is your friend. Okay. Um, I can't, can't stress that enough. Trade with the trend. People who counter trend trade tend to, you know, get a little bit uh, crazy with their risk management. Um, there's no, 
for sure way to read any of this. I have to have to tell you guys this now for sure. This is just my educated guesses. So educate yourselves as much possible as much as possible to have guesses that lose as minimal as possible. Um, but to continue with the with the fact that it breaks above and below, you see here that after with the moving average crossover happened again, that it broke completely below. And it stayed, all of these candlesticks stayed below both the blue and the red lines for like quite some time. So once you saw the fact that it crossed over once again and the, and the candlesticks broke completely below both of those lines, I would have taken this cell at this point right here, probably somewhere in this candlestick. And I could have ridden it all the way down to the fact that I saw that the candlesticks began to close above my red, uh, above my red moving average. Um, so that's where I would have ideally done. And the fact that you know that this is a trade with the trend is because this is a downtrending market. So what, like how to further influence what Robert said, he was looking for places in the reversal areas or the, the resistance areas for good sells. This trend line plus this little yellow, this little yellow square that I'll, that I'll explain a little bit more shortly. Um, those act as the, the resistance currently. That's what it's trying to do. So once I saw that it was almost hitting my resistance, it did the moving average crossover and the um, and it's downtrending. Um, it bounced off of my my key levels, which is over here at the minor key level, and completely broke through. All of those things confirm the fact that I wanted to place a sell here. You get what I'm saying? Did anybody catch all of that? Like it literally met most of my checkpoints for a sell. So I would recommend once it hit this little key level or this moving average crossover as a sell. And I only did that once I confirmed with my giant list of things that I need to confirm that most of them were crossed off the list because that's generally what you want to do, guys. You want to be confident in your trading strategy to the point where you don't even take the trend if it doesn't meet most of your requirements. So um, just to further uh, like prove the fact that these uh, candlesticks work with the moving uh, averages, they crossed over he yet again here right now. They're currently bouncing around the minor key level. And by the way, um, when you guys see a straight line, like, a, like a, a direct line, it does not signify a precise point. This minor key level is more of a general area. If I were to draw a rectangle to signify where the actual minor key level is, it'd be a lot more extensive. So it'd be like, for example, this would be more of the minor key level than the actual line. And the reason why you know that this would be the minor key level is because you see how all these candlesticks are breaking below this little rectangle that I've drawn here. That means this rectangle is the, is the actual minor key level and all those candlesticks are getting treated with a level of uh, resistance right now. But once it broke through, now it's gonna treat my rectangle as a level of support. And it's gonna try to ride my, rectang my rectangle all the way up at least until the trend line, which is where you identify stuff like take profit one, take profit two. And stuff like that. So you would you would identify that in accordance to how it conflicts with your trading plan. So the minute that you think that the markets are going to go the opposite direction with your trend or your trade, that's where you generally be putting your take profits at. Okay, um, that's for the moving averages. And then now I'm going to get into the rectangles. So I'm going to go back into the four hours. Okay, and this is to bounce off of what Robert was saying about the support and resistance. I don't uh, necessarily like using straight lines because then I feel like I'm going to have a whole bunch of lines all over my thing. Um, so I use this rectangle here to show levels of support and resistance. So what I did was um, I zoomed out as much as possible, even though this is like probably farther than I needed to. And I tried to identify as far back as I could, I guess, uh, without getting too uh, foggy about it, where the where this was playing around in the market. So as you can see right here, my rectangle actually meets a level of support previously in this market all the way to the left. And it's been acting as support for quite some time. There is even a point where it broke through my little rectangle area of support and resistance. It tried to break through it, but failed to. And the reason why it started to bounce back up is because it failed to break my little rectangle area. Another confirmation that this is a good level of support and resistance, as well as the fact that neither this point here on the left where I began my rectangle or this point over here where I tried to break through my rectangle, it stayed within my trend lines. So another confirmation that it's going to go where I think it's going to go, AKA in between these trend lines. And it's going to be keep moving in between them until it determines a zone where it, which it feels most comfortable. So then we get more into more recent timeframes and you can see how the previous level of support, it broke through 
that same level we were looking at with the moving average crossover and the, the original downtrend market, it completely broke through my rectangle zone. And so that's why I would say it was another reason for a sell. And now it's bouncing off the minor key level. And it bounced off that minor key level, like I said, acting as a level of support and resistance back into my yellow zone. So you see how everything I'm showing you is having something either bounce off of it or like completely break through. Those are like the make or break zones or MRAs, major, major reversal areas. They don't always have to reverse. They can sometimes go with your trend. Like for this example right here, where we showed you that this was uh, doing a temporary downtrend, that was currently going with the trend of the downtrend. However, on a longer time frame, we're currently going back up a little bit in order to go retest my yellow, yellow zone or to go retest my trend line. So ideally, what I would want to do here is have a take profit around here, because as you can see where my trend line ends is also another level of support and resistance. And the way that I can identify that is I'll draw another, another rectangle here. Boom. So that way you can see that there's another level of support and resistance. So now what I want to do, even though I'd already broke through the minor key level, I want more confirmations for me to take this as a buy. So I'm going to wait to see how it acts in my little yellow rectangle zone. If it completely breaks through my yellow rectangle zone, I will perfectly be okay with putting a buy on this until my next yellow rectangle zone, because these are major reversal areas. They're very high levels of support and resistance which are, if you haven't noticed by the fact that I keep repeating those words, they're very, very critical, support and resistance, for sure. Um, so yes, once you identify these yellow, these yellow rectangles, they become very useful, uh, trade with the trend. So ideally, if it's a downtrending market, you're looking, you're looking for great sell positions, okay? You can, buy, you can buy some stuff, like see how I told you I would probably put a buy into, from one yellow zone to the other? That would be an example of counter trend trading, which for example, would be a, like a lot harder. I can't give you that signal with a little bit more confidence as I would telling you to, to go on in a sell once it hits my yellow zone. But as of right now, um, another way that I would do that is going into the Fibonacci. So this is officially one, two, three, four, five. Okay, this is my fifth point on my checklist. So five out of five. And to go over which ones we did cover, the number one, Major, minor, quarter levels. The, the PIP number is in the chat. The second one on my checklist is trend lines. Daily, four hour, and one hour, okay? Uh, third one on my checklist is the moving averages, seven and 21 days. The fourth thing on my, on my list is known as supply and demand zones. They're also known as uh, major reversal areas, and they're also known as support and resistance, which are the yellow rectangles I've been showing you. Now to further confluence, uh, which is co confirm my trade idea, I'm gonna go here to this pitchfork looking thing on the left of Trader's View, then you click the arrow on the right and scroll down to where it says Fib Retracement. Fib is short for Fibonacci, okay? Um, the way that you use the Fibonacci retracement, if you wanna do so separately than Roberts were to predict where it's currently going as opposed to where you think it's gonna go later, um, the way that I learned it was that if you're in a downtrending market, what you're going to be doing for uh, retracement, retracement means it going the opposite direction before it actually goes with the trend. So for example, Fibonacci retracement would be an ideal point for one, for you to counter trend trade, or two, for you to find that sell zone, because right now we're currently using a downtrending market. So like I said, the way that I would use this Fibonacci retracement was I would go here to the extreme, to the extreme low, okay, because this is downtrending. I start from the lowest low, and I would extend myself. So about here, where is it at? The highest, the highest high. So as of right now, that would be my most recent high. Wait, oh, I'm so sorry. Hold on. Actually, we have to do this the opposite direction. I apologize. You would start from the, from the extreme high because we're, sorry, we're in a downtrend. You start from the high and you go to the low. In an uptrend, you start from the low and you go to the high. And I'll show you why I mean, I mean that. So I'll start from here, from the highest point, and I'll extend my bottom of my retracement to the bottom of the, of the chart, the bottom of the, the candlestick, if you will. And if you see that, it's still respecting my trend line on the daily, even though we're looking at it on four hours. So similarly to what Robert was saying about how he likes this, the zone of 0 0.5, it's because similar to yin and yang 
everyone that like what goes up must come down. You know what I'm saying? Uh, think of the 0.5 retracement level, kind of like gravity. You know what I'm saying? If you jump to a certain point, you're guaranteed to go down at least halfway down. You know what I'm saying? So that's the way that I look at it. Um, so as you can see right here to confirm that that's, that's how you, that's how you would use this. Um, this is my 100 point, you know what I'm saying? The, the, the 1.0 and you start from the high cause it's a, this is on downtrending market and you go to the low, we make sure that's your zero. And you can see right now the current candle is currently bouncing off of that 0.5 mark. So the reason why like you would know that that would be doing that 0.5 mark is cause it says it right here. It's literally, literally the actual candlestick is bouncing off the exact 0.5. So, um, this is going to tell me whether it's going to continue going on its downtrending or if it's going to shoot back up and try to go uptrending at least to the yellow zone. So right now, as you can tell from the wick and what we learned from Ash, the wick is signifying that it wants to go up, but the body of the actual candlestick signifies that it's too weak to actually do so. So um, as of right now, because it's a downtrending market, it's already hit that 0.5. I'd probably wait this trade a little bit more out before actually making a definitive decision. Um, another way that you could look at it, though, is that you can keep your Fibonacci open, work your way into smaller time frames to see generally what it's doing. Either use Ash's techniques or what you learned from Rob and I, and read these candlesticks to generally see if it's going to continue past that 0.5 or to continue to bounce down that 0.5. So as of right now, from what I can see, it looks like it's trying to break through that 0.5, but is ultimately unsuccessful right now because you can see that you like uh, Ash was saying, three to four candles to confirm a move. So I see three candlesticks with large wicks trying to go uptrending, and then the current candlestick is currently downtrending, which means as much as it tried to pass that 0.5, it wasn't able to do so. Um, I'm sorry, my internet connection's unstable. I hope everyone can still see and hear what I was saying. Um, confirm with some numbers in the chat if you guys can still see everything. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I got to answer some questions. I apologize. Do I have a specific color for each of my trend lines or you just choose whichever? Okay, yes. Um, I do have specific color trend lines for specific time frames. I personally like my daily time frames to be the color white. I like my four hour um, time frames to be like a lavender color. And then I like my one hour trend lines to be like, um, like a reddish orangey color, um, like a peach, I guess, if, if anything. Um, I feel like having everything different colors makes it easier for me to read personally. But if that's not your, your style, you can have your stuff monochromatic or whatever it is that you're, you're into. Less colors, the better. As long as it's simple and easy for you to read, then it really doesn't matter. Um, so that's to answer the, the color question. I use 7 and 21 because seven days signifies a week and 21 days is three weeks. And the reason why I use three weeks instead of a month is because not every month is the same amount of days. But one way I can confirm to measure how, mu how much a monthly really works out is to check the three week mark. I don't want to check 28 days because although there are 28 days in every month, 28 days is not a precise uh, movement. And as you guys know, the Forex market works five days a week. So it usually works between Friday and Sunday. It works on a weekly basis. And the reason why I want to keep stuff, I want to keep it all uniform. So you want to keep it seven for one week and then 21 for three weeks. Because like I said, 28 cannot be um, four weeks. Neither can 30 or 31. But yes, the average over seven days and the average over 21 days. She's got it. If you want the purple background to stand out, you can try a white background. Okay. Right, yeah, I didn't think about that. I do like my, my dark color theme. So if you guys would prefer me to switch to white for the example, I'll, I'll switch it over for you guys. Um. But if there are no more questions on that, that's how you, that's how I'd use the Fibonacci retracement. So as of right now, like I said, I'm waiting for this to make more moves uh, around this 0.5 area before determining whether it's going to shoot past it or ultimately go down. And another confirmation besides the one hour, this is like the lowest time frame I'm willing to go because I'm an intraday trader is the 15 minute. So as you can see right now, we have that moving average crossover that I love so much. Plus the fact that these candles are breaking a, above where they were breaking above and are now currently breaking below. We also have the doji, which is the type of candlestick right here, this bullish, this bearish doji, which signifies that reversal is coming. So once I see a moving average crossover, as well as the candle starting to break below this blue line, I'd probably ride this as a sell, to be honest, just to counter trend trade it back down at least. 
And if I wanted to give you an example of a take profit, I'd probably put it at this zone or the actual minor key level itself. Because like I said, these are heavy levels of support and resistance. And those are generally where you want your take profits are at. Um, so that's Fibonacci. Oh, hold on. I actually just noticed the chat popped up again. Oh man, I, I thank you guys so much. You're doing amazing. Oh, you guys humble me for real. I feel like I'm dropping a lot of stuff. So I really apologize if it's overwhelming. It's like information overload. Um, you guys can refer to this. I've recorded it all. Trust me. I've recorded it all. I'm going to put it on YouTube tonight. You guys can refer back to this whenever you guys are feeling uh, questionable about any of the techniques we've shared with you. But I'm glad this is really helping you guys out because I, I could have used this when I first started uh, back last March when I bought my first Bitcoin or whatever. Oh, another thing I forgot to give out. I'm going to give you guys a, a little nugget because you guys have actually stuck through three whole trading sessions with me. I apologize. These are all like 40 minutes each. Uh, I'm going to get you off here as quick as possible. Those are my, those are my checklists, okay? But the nugget that I was going to drop for you guys, okay? Uh, most of you guys, I bet, I'm assuming are U.S.-based, so you guys are going to be using, using U.S. dollars. Um, even if you don't use U.S. dollars, it still works out because you can use this to trade USD pairs, okay? And the, the nugget that I'm going to share with you guys today is called the DXY, right? And the DXY is the, uh, is the overall chart for how the US dollar by itself is doing. Okay, and what I mean by that is that like it gets all of the stock information, all of the companies, real estates, anything that the United States generally owns, you know what I'm saying? Like uh, when the government shut down these, this candles, these candles will tell you that, all of that. Like it literally shows you everything. So this is generally how the dollar moves by itself. And this right here is so powerful with, if you combine it with Forex Factory and investing.com, because you can literally have the ultimate take on all the news. You can see where the dollar by itself is always going to go. So when you do that, for example, um, let's say, um, let's say this is not true for, for this specific statement. This is an example. Um, let's say the DXY is currently downtrending, right? That means the dollar is going weaker. That means uh, by logical deduction, um, if you trade stuff that goes against the dollar, because the dollar's weak, the other stuff should be stronger. Okay. And what I mean by that, so if you see the DXY is currently in a downtrend, even from a monthly time frame or all the way down to the 15 minute time frame, you could generally assume that uh, stuff that goes against the dollar will be buys and stuff that the US dollar is against will be sells. And another way that you want to confirm that is obviously not only look at your DXY, but check the chart of the pair that you want to trade. So if this DXY, okay, yeah, 10 minutes, almost done. Okay, so if this DXY is downtrending, right, and you go on to EURUSD and you see that it's currently uptrending, that's two confirmations that the dollar is going weak and the euro is strong compared to that dollar. So I would use that as another confluence or another confirmation that you're going to take that buy. The DXY is, is beautiful. So especially, like I said, when you combine it with Forex Factory. So if you can read the physical news and how it impacts the DXY, aka the US dollars, and you go back to the DXY and you mark it all up, Make it look nice and pretty, nice and um, so you guys can read it. So as you can see right now, this was marked up like about a week or two ago from me. So my current trend lines are a little outdated and this support and resistance zone is currently being tested, which I think is nice because then I feel like this dollar is currently a little bit weak as failing to break that. Um, so now that I see that, I would go on stuff like the dollar being weak, you know what I'm saying? I would go on the Forex factory. I would check the news for the dollar, see how that's doing. Um, I would also check um, the USD JPY if I wanted to take that. So like how I told you guys earlier that we can predict um, the US dollar being like the DXY being a sell, the USD JPY being a sell because we saw it bounce off the 0.5. Another confirmation, AKA uh, checklist number six is the DXY is currently downtrending. So that means USD JPY will be going down because it's USD based. You know what I'm saying? And JPY should be going up. And another way that you can check for JPY, which is the second part of this beautiful nugget, because I, like I do recommend keeping the DXY and you do not need the key levels for DXY or for this other one that I'm about to show you just to, just to point that out. You just really need the trend lines and those rectangles and the moving averages even help if you, if you feel comfortable with those, but you don't have to use indicators if you don't like that. Uh, everyone just want to remind you. And this next one, the next nugget right here, because USD JPY is my favorite pair, is um, this is the JPN225. 
Now this is the, the Japanese yens DXY. This is the Japanese index. This is the, the real estate of Japan, the stocks of Japan, all of that accumulated into one chart. So another confirmation that I would say USD JPY is a sell is because we're looking at this JPY, the JPN 225, and we can see that it's currently uptrending. The moving averages are about to cross over. We have candlesticks breaking above both of my moving averages. Um, I'm pretty sure if I drew like a trend line on this, I mean, if I put a Fibonacci on this, it'll probably be hitting some type of zone that would be very significant. So all those things added up. So now we have a JPY uptrend. We have a DXY downtrend. We go on a regular USD JPY. We added all those technical things that I like to do, which you should generally apply everywhere. And you can generally see that this is not going to be bouncing off that 0.5 and it's probably going to continue this downtrend, at least into the minor key. That would be my ideal take profit one. And then my take profit two would probably be here at the, the 0.236 mark. So the exact pip would be 105.824. I don't know if you guys can see how I'm reading that. Over here to the left of your Fibonacci retracement, there will be a lot of numbers. Um, the, the number to the left, which says zero point whatever, that's the percentage or the ratios because Fibonacci was this crazy uh, science math guy that learnt, used complex calculus. We didn't care about that. It's the reason why we dropped out. We learned Forex. But at the end of the day, this guy used that stuff that he learned in school and we could utilize that. So I thought that was pretty dope. And the, it gives you the exact pip number here. So as you can see right here, my T P2 would be 105.824. And that would just be a general example of where I would use Fibonacci in order to get take profits. And then, like I said, make sure that all those checklists that I gave you guys all like solid out. And mind you, even if I gave you six things to check off, if four or five of those things hit, they don't have to be six out of six. If you guys feel confident enough in the trade and what I've taught you about it, take the trade. You know what I'm saying? Um, I feel like it's always better to be, uh, I feel like it's always better to have, um, sorry, to miss out on money than to lose money. But some people have different psychology than I do. Like, you know what I'm saying? I, I always use my, my stop loss um, and my take profits. I'm very critical of those. I like to not be on my phone or not have to watch the markets or not have to go read the news. I just want my trades to play out how I predict. So that's generally why um, I like to trade the way that I do. Oh, I forgot to mention how to calculate stop loss really quick before this video chat ends. Um, stop loss is um, usually because you can't really use Fibonacci to determine stop loss. What I do is that um, I, I look for previous market structure and I generally place it like anywhere from 10 to 20 pips above that. So if I were to place an entry, let's say, let's go off this exact pair that we're looking at, USD JPY, right? So let's say we were taking this for a sell. So that means our entry point would generally be about here. Here, I'll even circle it. Okay, that's generally our entry point, right? Okay, so the way that we would put a stop loss would be above mark, previous market structure. If we zoom back out a little bit more, um, depends on how long of a term you want to take this, this trade. Um, always have your risk to reward ratio uh, generally be anything over, I mean, the smallest I would recommend is one to one. So for example, what I mean by one to one risk reward is that if you're trying to catch 50 pips in profit, be willing to lose at least 50 pips in your stop loss. That's, that's sparingly. I don't even like taking one-to-one -one trades, to be honest. If you catch any of my personal signals, it'll probably be a two-to-one. The highest trade I've sent out is a five-to-ones. And the reason why I did that was a 531 profit and a 100 pip loss, stop loss. And uh, that trade ended up being pretty beneficial for most of, for most of that um, because that was my take profit three. But um, generally, like I said, keep your, keep your uh, risk to reward even or if not more towards the risk side. I mean, more towards the reward side than the risk side. Sorry, I said that. Um, the way that I identify the stop loss would be the previous market structure. And another way to look at it using this Fibonacci, because remember the cell that we're in is in this circle. The previous market structure would be one here at that 0.618 mark. Um, here, I'll even put another rectangle so you guys can see. This is another previous market structure right here. But that stop loss is kind of close, depending on how many pips it is and stuff like that. So I probably wouldn't do that. This would be more for a shorter term trade. But this is uh, generally where the market structure previously was. And you can zoom out to generally see that that, that remains true even when I extend it out here. So that would be an ideal stop loss 
for a shorter time frame uh, trade. However, you can also put, put it completely above market structure and go here for a, for a higher stop loss for a, in terms of a longer term trade. And the reason why I picked it here was if you notice that my Fibonacci retracement ratios are also being hit by my yellow rectangles. So that, that gives another confirmation that Fibonacci knows what he was talking about here in terms of these ratios and these zones. So um, you could put it here, you could put it here, but the ideal place, because like I said, I'm a longer term trader, would be here at this, at this previous yellow rectangle. And the reason why is because even on a longer, longer time frame, this was the highest level of support and resistance thus far for like quite some time. So that would ideally where I would be put my stop loss and I'll get rid of my current yellow rectangle and put it here, which is at my one point one, ah, sorry, 107.688. That's where I would generally put it because that's above the previous market structure, a little bit above the wick. So don't make sure not to, to put it exactly where the wick is. And the reason why is because brokers tend to make fake out wicks for you guys to get your money taken. Okay. I can't stress that enough. A lot of people don't even realize that the brokers are out to get you. So make sure that you place your stop loss almost precisely above the market structure or below the market structure, not exactly at the market structure. Because like I said, those brokers will try to take you out of your trade. So ideally my stop loss would be above these candlesticks, probably here. This would be, I'm going to put an exact horizontal line too. Like about here, right? Where it clearly says support and resistance. That's where I would put my, my stop loss. And then my take profit, um, I would calculate that with risk to reward ratio. So because we're taking this for a sell position, you'd go over here to the, to the right, I mean to the left. And if long position is when you want to put in for a buy and short position is when you want to put in for a sell. So I go here, go to the most recent candlestick because that's where I'm entering at today. And there you go. Now you can see my, my trade position and you right click that little, that little thing that you picked out, right? You put the exact entry point that you're getting in. So let's say I got in at 106.468. And then my stop loss would be uh, 107.69.688. And then my take profit could be, uh, let's say 104, whatever. We're not, we're not worried about that right now. Um, so this is generally how it would look here. I'll delete my Fibonacci so it looks a little less confusing for you guys, as well as this circle. Right, this is just to wrap it all up. Um, so right here, as you can see, this would be my ideal trade. And it tells you right here, my risk to reward ratio is 2.02. .02. So I'm willing to lose 122.